You have saved untold lives through your defeat of Lord Vivica and the destruction of the plague. There's a title reserved for the most prestigious among us, whose wisdom and skill safeguard the galaxy. It hasn't been bestowed in thousands of years. But you have proved worthy. Now the Council names you Barsan Thor, Warden of the Order. We are one voice, one order, bound together by the Force. Through her actions, this Jedi has proved worthy for our Order and the Force itself. We grant you the rank of Jedi Master. Protect and guide the Republic as the Force guides you. Rise, and may the Force be with you. Your power and tactics have got you this far, Jedi, but no further. I'm tired of your delusions. Explain yourself. The combined strength of your masters will make me the most powerful Force adept who has ever lived. I am Terak Morage. Turn away from this path, Parcanus. Years of Jedi training cannot have simply vanished. Fight back. The Order can help you. Parcanus Tark died long ago. Even Vivica is merely a skin to be shed. No one can oppose me. I am beyond flesh. Beyond death. I will crush you, Jedi. And your shattered body will fuel my rebirth! The children of the Emperor will revive. When the Republic falls, I will ensure Corellia's government is rewarded for aiding us. I can't believe what I'm seeing. What have we done? You kindly entrusted the Guardian Holds to me. And I, in turn, entrusted them to my brothers and sisters. Goodbye, Jan, Satil, and thank you. According to the Jedi Archives, the rank of Bar Senfor is given to those who are exceptionally worthy, to the Jedi who sacrifice themselves for the sake of others, the Jedi who searches for delight in even the darkest of souls. This is the story of the third Bar Senfor in all of Jedi history. In roughly the year of 3643 BBY, a young Padawan is sent to Typhon to undergo their final trials under the guidance of an infamous Jedi Master, Master Yuan Pa. Upon arrival to Typhon, the birthplace of the Jedi, the Padawan is greeted by a member of the Council named Seo Bikan, who introduced them to the world and prepares them for their journey to the temple. Seo Bikan remarks that the Padawan's abilities have been shared in great esteem. They have exceeded expectations, and Seo Bikan believes they haven't seen someone so powerful in decades. By the time Master Yuan Pa arrives, they already have an urgent mission. Flesh Raiders were rampaging through the region, which was putting ancient artifacts at great risk. It was the Padawan's duty to ensure the artifact's safety. Seo Bikan objects to throwing the Padawan into the deep end so soon, but Yuan Pa remarks that the Padawan was stronger at four years old than she was herself at fifteen. A Padawan who was stronger in the Force at four years old than I was at fifteen? Gifted students need greater challenges. She is confident that her new Padawan can handle the task, and she was right. The Padawan successfully secures the holo recordings, which were ancient artifacts that would teach new generations of Jedi. However, the final artifact was missing when they arrived. This led the Padawan down a rabbit hole of ancient history as their final trials took shape. Venturing with them was Kaizen Fess, a Trandosian warrior who was incredibly loyal to Master Yuan. She asks Kaizen to venture with the Padawan, and he agrees. The Padawan discovers that a radicalized Twi'lek from the nearby Kalakori village had been following the teachings of an ancient Jedi master named Rajivari, and sought to unlock their secrets and power. As the breadcrumbs are followed, the Padawan comes across invaluable relics, such as the hilt of the first ever Jedi weapon, and more ancient hollow recordings that reveal truths around Jedi origin and the first ever civil wars. As it would turn out, 
This ancient Rajavari was responsible for allowing dark side practices, and caused infighting that later led to the banishment of dark side teachings. Rajavari sought to cleanse the Jedi Council, and replace it with people more open to the spectrum of the Force. Rajavari was defeated in the end, but he refused to become one with the Force, and remained on Typhon among his devices as a ghost. Using the devices he left behind, he could imprint decades of teachings into an acolyte's mind and complete his original goal of reforming the Jedi Order. The rogue Twi'lek was targeted as his successor, but the mighty teachings sent him mad with power and forced a Padawan to intervene. They discovered the ghost of Rajavari, and they told them that the rogue Twi'lek sought to destroy the lightsaber forge. Rajivari sees the Padawan carries the ancient hilt, which they further advise should be restored and powered with a crystal, so the weapon may be used again, meaning the Padawan would wield the first ever Jedi weapon, quite the flex among peers. After saving the forge and constructing their weapon, the Jedi Council recognises them as a fully fledged Jedi of the Order, a Jedi Consular. Before this council, I take from you the title of Padawan. I name you a full Jedi of our order. Honor the past, work for the future. May the Force be always with you. You've done so well, my student. I'm... Master Yuan? Just as the ceremony of promotion ends, disaster strikes. Jedi Master Yuan Pa suddenly falls ill. The Council deem it best to send Master Yuan to their best medical researchers on Coruscant. They've been recovering artifacts from the First Jedi Temple, and may know what to do about this mysterious illness that has taken hold of Master Yuan. When arriving on Coruscant, the illness gets even worse. Master Yuan lashes out against everyone around her, forcing the Consular to defend themselves and defeat her. Master Yuan seems possessed, or crazed, talking madness and yelling the name Parkanus. When Master Yuan is finally restrained again, the Jedi Consular is informed of ancient Jedi relics known as Noeticons, a special group of Jedi holocrons that house the virtual avatars of infamous Jedi through history. Jedi who know almost anything, and hopefully, a way to identify this illness and how to cure it. After a wild goose chase, the Consular finally finds what they are searching for. The Noeticons lead the Jedi to an ancient terminal within the destroyed temple on Coruscant. Here, they are able to learn an ancient healing ritual. The avatars of the Noeticons, including the likes of Bastila Shan and Master Vandar, are confident that Master Yuan is suffering from a dark side plague that has been used before, a plague that can turn Jedi to the dark side and control their minds. It was necessary for the Consular to learn an ancient healing technique, only obtainable from this very location at the temple. After hours of meditation, they unlock the healing power, but are immediately confronted by a Sith Lord. The Sith claims to have a master that wants the machine that knows the ritual destroyed. The Consular safely assumes here that the Sith's master must also be the person causing the Dark Side plague, especially if they want this ability deleted from history. Unfortunately for them, the Consular already learned it, so destroying the terminal was futile. The Consular beats them down and moves on back to their master. Using the healing ritual would come with great cost. Upon every use, parts of their life force would be drained. The Noeticons warned that the previous user died. Willing to take the risk, the Consular heals their master and severs their tie to the would-be Plague Master. With a mission successful, a new mission begins. More Jedi from around the galaxy began presenting signs of the same illness, some even speaking the name Parkanus again. Although the cost would be high, the Consular was the only person who knew the healing ritual now, so saving their lives was a duty, perhaps even an honour. The Consular seeks out each Jedi stricken by the plague, slowly unravelling the mystery of Parkanus, visiting the worlds of Taris, Nar Shaddaa, Tatooine, and Alderaan, 
Eventually, they figure out that the Plague Master is a rogue Jedi named Lord Vivekar. This rogue Jedi appeared to be working for the Sith Empire now, but even that was not the whole truth. Turns out that Lord Vivekar's name used to be Parkanus. Many years ago, a team of Jedi ventured to Malachor Free. Here, something went horribly wrong and Parkanus was left alone, abandoned. An ancient Dark Lord known as Terak Morhage had a tomb nearby and Parkanus stumbled across it. The ancient entity possessed Parkanus and corrupted him to the dark side. Terak Morhage reveals himself when confronted by the Jedi Consular and reveals a terrible truth. If the Consular kills the Plague Master, then they also kill every Jedi affected by the plague. Although the cost is high, no one would ever suffer this awful fate again. Alternatively, the Consular could choose to use the healing ritual and cleanse Parkanus of Terak Morhage's corruption, but this would mean Terak Morhage survives and could possibly return. Unwilling to murder hundreds of Jedi, the Consular sacrifices a great deal of their power to redeem Parkanus. With the final bond broken, the power and life force that was lost should be returned. The redeemed Jedi finds a new home in the forests of Typhon, in isolation and at peace. The Jedi Consular returns to the Jedi Council victorious. They recognize the Consular's success through perseverance and self-sacrifice. Collectively, they decide to bestow the rank of Barsenfor, Warden of the Order. The title has not been granted in thousands of years, and the Consular marks the third in all of history to take its position. With the ongoing Cold War still in force, recent events have the war in Imperial favour. Because of this, many worlds that were allied with the Republic have lost confidence and created their own system, named the Rift Alliance, a collective of worlds who threat to leave the Republic unless they start to take them more seriously and defend them. Losing these worlds would mean utter defeat for the Republic, so the Supreme Chancellor himself requests the Barsenfor as the newest representative. Appointed to restore faith between the Rift Alliance worlds and Republic, to help see their needs met and their worlds secure. With this grave task, the Council find it appropriate for the Barsenfor to be given the rank of Jedi Master. They'll be needing the resources it grants to fulfil their urgent mission. It can't be confirmed, but this could be the fastest promotion to Jedi Master we've ever seen, even faster than Satil Shan herself. Upon first contact with a diplomat from the Rift Alliance, the Barsenfor was alerted to Sith presence and danger. The Empire had found the newest members of the Rift Alliance and were holding them captive. The Barsenfor intervenes and as usual saves the day. After being introduced to all delegates and representatives, the Barsenfor begins their mission by helping secure Balmora. In doing so, they can take control of the droid factories and bring thousands of units against the Empire. Right now, the world is under heavy occupation, now led by Darth Lacris, the apprentice to Darth Ma. Search for Star Wars The Old Republic, The Price of Power, on my channel to find a really cool short story about Darth Lacris and Darth Ma. The Barsen 4 teams up with the ongoing Resistance's leader, Zenith, a capable soldier. While on Balmora, the Barsen 4 encounters a Sith who allied themselves with Lacris to save their people. But the Barsen 4 manages to convince them to choose another path, showing their capability of finding the light even in the darkest places. Eventually, the Barsen 4 comes face to face with Lacris herself and defeats her during aggressive negotiations. Freeing Balmora from total occupation for the first time in years, with some faith in the Republic's ability restored, the Barsenfor moves on to the next task. In the meantime, the Barsenfor stumbles across the Sith comrade of the former Sith Lord they killed back when they first rescued the Delegates. This Sith's name was Lord Kyrus. They revealed that they had ears aboard the Barsenfor's personal starship, implying a traitor was among them. The statement was backed up when Nadia Grell, one of the Delegates, found a monitoring device on board the ship, probably used to listen in on diplomat conversations. 
For now, they would keep a close eye on all members of the crew, which was growing fast. The next world the Barsenfor visits is Hoth, and here they face a pirate and would-be immortal, who uses advanced armor to keep themselves alive, instantly healing lethal wounds. With the help of Commander Felix, the mission on Hoth is a success and the pirate is apprehended. The Republic would experience no further attacks from pirates controlled by the Thug. Upon returning to the ship, Nadia alerts the Bar Senfor to encrypted messages that leaked information from aboard the ship. After ruling out the other members, they guess that Delegate Member Blazus could be responsible or know about the situation. However, Nadia's father, who is also a delegate, confesses that the king and queen of their homeworld were gifting regiments to them. He had already sent Blazus to make contact. Sensing a bad feeling about this, the Barsenfor rushes off after Blazus. They find him with the Sith Lord Kairos and holding the king and queen of Sakai hostage. At this encounter, the Barsenfor learns a terrible truth. The delegate Blazus had actually been a Force-sensitive Sith this entire time, serving as some kind of double agent. This spelled bad news as the Rift Alliance was just getting on its feet with rebuilding relations with the Republic. This betrayal of Blazus would be felt across the galaxy. But the plot deepens. Blazus reveals he is a child of the Emperor, chosen by the Divine Leader himself and tasked with seeing his vision made reality. This meant that the Sith Emperor was aware of every interaction the Barsenfor had made so far. And worse yet, Blazus says he's not the only child of the Emperor out there. After defeating Blazus, the King and Queen affirm their loyalty to the Republic and express their gratitude to the Rift Alliance for aiding them, greatly increasing their reputation across the galaxy. But today's reveal was tragic. The Republic had been infiltrated by the Sith Emperor. The Bar Senfor brings this terrible news back to the Jedi Council. Despite already having bad news, the Jedi Council also bear bad news. The galaxy is at full-scale war once again. The Treaty of Coruscant has been broken and the Empire have launched massive assaults across the galaxy. Seemingly, the deciding battle will be on Corellia and its shipyards. Seo Bikan of the Jedi Council instructs the Bar Senfor to build an armada to fight back against the Empire and eventually the children of the Emperor. Before setting out on their task, Seo Bikan lets them know the Noeticons have been reconstructed on Typhon and refuse to talk to anyone. Seo thinks the Bar Senfor might be able to communicate with them. He was right. When they arrived, the Noeticons spark to life and the Avatars speak with them again. Given the fact they need to build an army, the Noeticon reveals that the ancient Rakata imprisoned a sleeping army on an unknown world. Finding this army could be beneficial to the Republic. They discovered that the unknown world was named Bausavis and had been known to the Republic for quite some time now, but it was in fact top secret. The entire planet was covered in constructions used as prison cells for dangerous aliens. Many of the cells lay empty or perhaps have husks of beasts, but some are still occupied to this day, even after 20,000 years of being there. The Bar Senfor discovers the sleeping army, which are a species known as Eshkar. To learn more about Belsavis, check out my explained video on the topic. As the Bar Senfor recruits more to their cause, more children of the Emperor seem to pop up. Each one speaks of a person called the First Son, a person who was leading them. Each time one is discovered, they just so happen to be opposing what the Bar Senfor wants to be doing. Given the fact Blazus was already exposed and defeated, this meant that somehow the Emperor still knew what they were up to. A traitor was still among them. After aiding the world of Voss and recruiting a mystic and their entourage, another terrible truth is revealed on the world of Corellia. Seo Bacan was actually the first son. The Sith Emperor had taken control of his mind long ago and planted him in the Jedi Order and Council. Ever since has been using him as a conduit to secrets and deception, the First Son was able to shield the other children of the Emperor from being discovered through the Force, so defeating them would mean exposing the other members. 
After a hard-fought battle, the first son was defeated by the Barsenfor, and the world of Corellia was no longer in the Emperor's grasp. They may choose to kill them, or help encourage Seo Bikan to take control over his mind again. When the bond is finally broken, the other members of the children are exposed and hunted down, Corellia in Good Republic favour, the Emperor's plans thwarted, and Seo Bikan successfully redeemed. These acts and more were enough to convince the Jedi to give the Barsenfor a seat on the Jedi Council. They would be replacing Seo Bikan, as he can no longer serve. The Barsenfor will also choose which Rift Alliance delegate to appoint the Republic. In my personal playthrough, I chose Shuru from Manan. I feel that world deserves it the most. Many thousands of years later, the Barsenfor's tomb can be found within the Jedi Academy game, cementing them into history.